Hey everybody, it's Seth Jones, Editor-in-Chief of Golfdom Magazine, and it's my honor to be doing another Anuvia Legends interview presented in partnership with Audubon International. This month I'm being joined by Ted Horton, CGCS, a longtime superintendent with stops at such places as Pebble Beach, Winged Foot, Brightview Golf Maintenance, and numerous courses both in the States and internationally. Ted, thanks for taking the time to join me today. It's great to see you. Tell me, what have you been up to these days? Um, I, I'm fully retired at this point, which I think is uh, something that most people aspire to do. I'm not sure that I ever did aspire to that because it's it's kind of hard to always fill your time appropriately. But I've I've um, um, I'm, I'm continuing to volunteer as a board member with Audubon International, and with that, um, uh, I've gotten very involved in the in the uh, Monarchs in the Rough, and I've, I've uh, given a number of lectures at, at various garden clubs and libraries in our local communities uh, about monarchs. And I think I've gotten a lot of young people and families uh, very intrigued with planting milkweed and, and, and developing habitat, which is kind of fun. Also on the board and a volunteer with my wife on a, a, uh, an organization called Helping Hands, which is a faith-based organization that uh, provides a great deal of food to uh, to needy persons throughout. They're primarily uh, senior citizens uh, making tough decisions between paying the rent or, or feeding themselves. And I kind of uh, am very involved in a kind of a little section where we get called from the uh, Riverside uh, uh, County uh, saying, hey, there's a family that needs uh, a ramp uh, because they've got a, a family member who has been bad, badly injured and they can't get in the house without a ramp. So I have a couple of uh, uh, friends who are part of our crew and we go, go over and build ramps and slowly but surely our ramps are becoming more and more compliant <laughs> as, as we learn. Um, yesterday, as silly as it might sound, I, I spent uh, half a day changing out um, uh, nine volt batteries in, in, uh, in fire alarms in, in various elderly people's houses and that was kind of nice and it's one 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 house that I was in yesterday. It had to be a three million dollar house, and I'm looking around and saying, "My goodness gracious, what am I doing? Changing batteries in this house for?" But but they they uh, they're they're on their their last dollar. They they were borrowing against their house and 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 hadn't been able to make a decision to get into a smaller place. And both of them, uh, both husband and wife, were were basically invalids, uh, crawling up and down the stairs type of thing. And and it's kind of scary when you see stuff like that. Well, good for you. That's that's awesome. It's yeah. you know, you've done. You, you you clearly you you don't have any time to uh, to sit and rest. You got you like to keep well, moving. You know, and and as um um as an aside, we've just moved. My my wife insisted that we were not going to get stuck in the big house uh, before it was too late to move ourselves and take care of things and have our kids have to do it. And, so we've sold our house and we've moved to a smaller house in a gated community and everything like that. And that that in itself was traumatic. I mean, that means that, you know, 7,000 pictures you've been saving just really have to go into a box or or thrown out and all that sort of stuff. It, it, it It's a tough, tough, tough thing to go through for most most people when you've got a whole career of flax that there just isn't a place to put anything. I know. And, I know. and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's interesting, very interesting. Yeah. Glad we did it while we're just strong and healthy. Good, good, yeah. And when I say I know, it's not because I think I have anywhere near the collection of the stuff that you've seen, but I've but I've seen it happen to other people, and it is. It's 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 quite. Uh, you know, I can yeah. imagine the souvenirs and the things that you've gotten over the years. It's just probably yeah, you just yeah, you just yeah, they're meaningful to me, but they don't mean much to anyone else. And and you really you almost have to be gutsy enough to throw them out, or at least set them aside in a box and 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 just write mementos on the corner and stick it up on the on the on the shelf <laughs> well you know you got to be careful with that too because there's a lot of people who'd be like hey that's that's ted horton's uh notepad from uh you know 1983 i kind of like to see see that you know you don't want to throw you know it, it's hard you to know see. seth that that's interesting because like like old 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 characters who have gone gone through a long career i've always thought i, I could write, write some memoirs and stuff like that so i had saved all my daily logs and all that stuff over the years and in this move um they they didn't they didn't get saved. I mean, no. I, I got rid of. Them. Oh. Yeah, which is it was hard. It was hard. It was hard. But I but I don't know how you just can't keep all that stuff. You just yeah. can't. Wow. What what what? A, you're blowing my mind right now. I'm just wondering what it was. You know, yeah. the stuff that you probably you know. Well, but yeah. 
think about it because you're probably in the very same situation and I know all, all my friends are. Yeah. It's just just you got to come down down to it at some point. And if I didn't have the steel hand of my wife behind me, I'd still be sitting on all these boxes of stuff. I understand. <laughs> yes. Uh, so Ted, let's talk about just you, you know I, I you you've had a career unlike anyone else. You know you you from from the places you've been and the things you've seen and the things that you've brought to the industry. Um, it's just. Did you ever look back at just the, the thing, the, the, the places you've set foot and the golf courses that you had, you put your thumbprints on and, and just take a moment to appreciate it? Oh, yeah, oh of course I do. Um, I, I think I have been extremely fortunate. I think I've worked hard and I've tried hard all, all the way through, but, but I had some wonderful opportunities and I think I was fortunate enough to take advantage of most of the opportunities I've had. You know, in, in, in thinking back, you, you always look, look back and say, gee, I wonder if I had done such and such a thing. There are a couple of things I wonder. When I was at Winged Foot, the chairman of IBM uh, was a member of Winged Foot. He came up to me and said, Ted, IBM is very anxious to, to uh, get away from maintaining any of its properties around uh, and being associated with the maintenance in particular because of the, the uh, liabilities associated with chemicals at the time, but associated with maintenance of their properties. We would be willing to completely fund you, put you in business, start you up as a landscape um, maintenance person, and you would take care of the IBM properties. And that included several golf courses as well as their, their corporate grounds all over the country. And everything like that. I often wonder how, how that might have worked out. I also sat back and, and looked at my career and I said, you know, I had an opportunity where one of the, I will call them one of the better landscape um, uh, maintenance companies, the owner uh, came up to me and said, Ted, you know, this, this was long before contract maintenance went out into golf courses. I said, Ted, what if, what if we set up a, um, what if we set up a, a company to maintain golf courses and, and you could run that for us. And I, and I, all of these times I was still at Wingfoot, US Opens coming up and everything like that, and I was pretty excited by my job. And so I, I, uh, I bypassed those things. You wonder if, you always wonder if. That's interesting. I, I have a question yeah. I wanna, I don't wanna put you on the spot with this question, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what it is and then I'll come back to it. But one thing I've always liked to ask is just like, you know, who are some of the golf luminaries who have meant a lot to you through the years? But, but before we get to that one, uh, what are some of the, you know, just, can you name drop some of the places that really stand out to you that you look back on and you, you, you say, you know what, the sunset on number 18 is unlike any other is, or having a, having a drink at the clubhouse at this place. What, what are some of the places that really stand out to you is, well, you just, well I mean, world? My, I started my career at, at um, 23 years old as a superintendent at Wingfoot Golf Club. And uh, um, um, Wingfoot has always been a very, very storied golf course with uh, They've always felt they had one of the lowest per capita handicap golfing membership uh, in, in the country. And, and I came away from that thing. That's probably still, from my experiences, having seen a number of very fine clubs, one of the finest golf clubs. And I, and I very deliberately call it a golf club because it was pure golf. I mean, if, if uh, they had a golf event that was teeing off on the first hole of the East Course, the proximity of the pool was uh, forced them to shut down the pool because they didn't want any noise interfering with golf. So that's, that's the type of golf club it was. I then went to Westchester Country Club, which I still feel is, is one of the finest country clubs. And, and um, um, both of those today still exist as just very fine examples of golf and country club two very different entities it's very interesting because working at wingfoot it was pure golf it was not particularly friendly to my family or anything like that it was golf and golf alone westchester country club was was a wonderful spot my my wife and kids absolutely enjoyed it and it was a very different thing because it was a country club and you could get lost in the in the country club um aspects of it um, and get away from just the pure golf. So those things. And of course, I had the opportunity to work at Pebble Beach Resorts. And Pebble Beach Company, I think, is still probably one of the finest American resorts that we have. So I've, I think I've seen just about the, some of the finest and purest of those three different specific types of golf. And, and that, that's very fortunate. That's good. That's great. And, and then what about, like, 
you worked for you worked for kings and and whatnot you know I mean, what some of the tell, do you want to tell that story or, or do you want to tell me about some of the people who really stand out in your mind it's just people who well, well well i mean like like everybody else i think early on um as my career was being sort of um fostered i i looked for mentors and my first mentor was of course joe troll who was at the university of massachusetts and and our professor and i'll still remember the very first turf grass lecture I heard from him and, and you hear hear this over and over and over all it takes to grow grass is drainage 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 and and um, and that my, my uh, crew at Wingfoot when I left them gave me a plaque that said all Ted don't forget all it takes to grow grass is a crack in the sidewalk which was kind of pulling me down a peg or two which is kind of <laughs> nice I then I uh, went to work for Sherwood um, who more at Wingfoot who I guess is a is a you know a bastion of our career in in uh, in golf course um, management. He was at Wingfoot. I was introduced to turf management by Jeff Cornish, um, and then then uh, I don't know if you ever did you ever know Jim McLaughlin? Jim McLaughlin uh, was a past um, um, executive director of GCSA, but he was the executive director of the Met GCSA for years and years while I knew him when I was in the New York, New York area. And I felt Jim was probably one of the smartest um, individuals in golf that I knew. He was, he was probably ahead of his time to the extent that he got himself into trouble a lot. Um, he just wasn't, just people were not ready for some of his thinking. And I just found it fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So those four individuals really, I, I owe probably most of my, success if if it has been successful to those individuals in in my career and of course my wife i mean i can't ever ever uh, uh going there without mentioning what an influence my wife has been in my life fantastic fantastic good job and please give her my regards it was i, I enjoyed having dinner with you. you guys at, at uh gis yeah, last you, year that was great uh and, and i'd be remiss if you know i mean i of course we can name drop uh, your your the places you've been and seen and and whatnot. But what about let's talk let's get um let's get technical let's 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 talk about growing the grass out of the cracks of the turf. I'm curious if there's something that you think is really exciting in golf maintenance today that is going to be even bigger going forward. That you think those guys they're onto something there. Is there any practices that you're really excited about? I I think probably one of the most important changes I've seen is that is that the, the golf course superintendent has become increasingly more professional as time has gone by. And I'll, and I'll tell a couple of stories to, to, to uh, augment that. In particular, um, when I was first, um, uh, I spent my first year in the United States, I grew up in Canada, emigrated to the United States when I decided I wanted to go, go to UMass, but I had a year in between going to school because they had a, an out of quote, uh, out of state quota that that um, had to be completed. So I traveled up and down the East Coast working on various golf courses. I went to a lecture um, where uh, uh, Richard Tufts gave a talk. And he, he of course, is the, the mentor, the founder of Pinehurst. Mm -hmm. And he got up and he said, you know, I'm supposed to be talking about the costs of turf grass maintenance, but he said, our superintendents that I, that I have known just don't keep good enough records that I can really, really uh, uh, give a very decent talk about that. And that influenced me tremendously uh, going forward. I said to myself, the very first thing I'm going to do is keep better, better records because I don't want any Richard Tufts talking about my profession in that fashion ever again. That, that, hence, that was the very first article I ever had uh, uh, printed in the... I, it wasn't called golf. It was golf superintendent, I think, at the time. The magazine, and it was uh, the the uh, costs of, of uh, turf grass maintenance. And I and I did time studies and had everything down to to the number of minutes it takes to do every job and all all that sort of stuff. So I, I really thought that was extremely important. The other the other story that that I think emphasizes how we become more professional is that. You're seeing more and more superintendents become general managers. Now, when I was a superintendent and as I was climbing up through my career, I aspired to be a general manager, perhaps, and I applied um, for a job. And I was uh, interviewed by one of the very large, one of the larger search firms 
uh, out of Chicago area at the time. And, and they said to me, this, Ted, this is the finest application we've ever seen, but we just don't think that a golf course superintendent could be a, a manager. And, and I was offended at that tremendously because I had been acting as general manager for a year at that particular property already. And I knew I could do it. And I, I really was sort of upset at that. Technology has changed dramatically. And there was no cell phone when I, when I started out. Uh, the communication has, has improved uh, 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 amazingly or gotten in our way. I'm not sure which at this point. The um, um, uh, environmental awareness. Um, we, you know, as a early superintendent, I think we were, we, we, we cared about our properties, but I don't think we ever really understood the overall interaction of everything that we were doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the environment and our maintenance. I think strategic and long range, plan, long range planning on the golf course has improved tremendously. I, um, I know that I have spent a great deal of time of late helping properties develop what I would call long range planning and, and, and understanding that if you don't plan for those expenses tomorrow, you're not going to be prepared to, to do them when, when they come along. Safety awareness um, uh, is, is a world of difference from what it used to be. Uh, I, one of the, we got our, um, an assistant and I got a, um, an award from GCSA for an article that we'd written, which I think was one of the, the first sort of very comprehensive uh, articles on what to do about safety on the golf course. We'd save boxes and boxes of every article, whether it was a bee sting or a, or a finger cut um, and what to do and how to avoid it going forward. And I thought that was very, very uh, important. I think the elevation of the profession in the public eye. I mean, I think people are far more aware of, of what a superintendent does and, and are far more prepared to, to, to value that profession than they were before. Uh, I've watched things come along since, since I first began, such as the stimp meter and the moisture meter and the, and the firmness meter and what all, all of those things that are, how, can, can, can finally put numbers on some of the things that was pure, pure feel and pure he, hearsay for, for years and years and years. Um, the refinement of, of, of mowing, tri, uh, triplex mowing, lightweight mowing. I can never, I'll never forget the, we were the very first uh, golf course at Westchester to take triplex mowing into a tournament. And I, I had to have a whole discussion with the, uh, um, the PGA Tour staff at the time about whether we were going to be permitted to do that because they were afraid that because of the striping effect that television was going to come in and start dictating how we how they wanted us to mow for for the appearance on television and so we had to kind of get over that that uh, initial impact and also i, I did an, an article um about the costs of triplex mowing and it, it was really easy because it, it was it, you know everyone everyone said you're nuts ted you can't you can't afford to, to pick up clippings and triplex mows mow fairways and everything like that and i and i and i was able to take all these numbers and put them together by twisting a few facts or so, and, and indicate you can't afford not to, um, and and uh, and so that was a great advance in my, my life. Um, I, I I'm amazed at how much information is available today online. You can look up and study and get information on almost anything today. I mean, um, that none of that was available when I when I first was involved. Um, and, and, and in particular, just to kind of bring it all home, I'm I'm sitting here watching the 2020 U.S. Open at Winged Foot Golf Club and comparing it to my superintendent days where we had a, the Open in 74, 40, what, 46 years ago. And, and I'm saying, gosh, he has 55 employees? And I had, you know, and on and on and on. <laughs> Things have changed. <laughs> and, and, and they've changed for the good. They have. Very good. Yeah. And it's, it's fun. You say, you know, a lot of those things that you mentioned, it's, and you talk about, you know, all the things that we measure and, and chart now, and then we store it all online. And, you know, it's been exciting to just in my 20 years of working in your guys' sandbox, I, I've enjoyed to see just, just a, a glimpse of that and be part of it somewhat. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I agree with you. It is, it's, you guys have really elevated the profession and it's just been a matter of, I, do you think back when, you heard the, the him say that there's not enough information to 
to chart how much uh, it costs to maintain the turf? Did, was that was that the moment? Was or did that like anger you to the point to where you got inspired, or was that just a moment? A well, moment? That, and that was that was that was before I was even a superintendent. That was that was the year in between. I had worked on as, as I had finished my schooling at, at McGill. I had taken a year off and work, was working on golf courses as as uh, labor and just to understand it, I was trying to get a, uh, a feel for southern grasses because I hadn't had that experience up in Montreal. So um, I went to this one conference in um, in Tifton, Georgia, and that's where Richard Tuss talked. Yes, it. It didn't anger me because I wasn't a superintendent. I, I you couldn't blame me, but it, but it, it 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 inspired me to do better, and and I think we have done better. We and superintendents in general. Good, good. I that's think, a, that's I interesting. Think, yeah. Very interesting, Ted. What uh, now? We, we talked about how the, the the profession has changed so much, but I'm curious what um, what do you think the young guys got to worry about now? What what advice do you have for this next generation of superintendents who are just now? you know they, they have they have all this new knowledge they have there's there's the expectations are also you know for everybody it's going to be pretty high do you have any uh words of wisdom for the the young people in the industry who are well, doing it yeah i i yeah well my words of wisdom i'm whether they be be uh, of much value i'm not sure but if if it's at all possible um kind of if you can determine what area of turf management you want to to uh, to to develop a future and then try and develop your pedigree as early as possible. Seek out somebody who is obviously the champion of of that particular area, whether it's whether it's superintending or of a of a large um, municipal operation, whether it's a resort or whether it's a championship PGA Tour tournament event uh, property. Try to determine if that's what you really want. Look for an individual who really clearly has has that reputation of training young people. Look for the track record of the young people who have worked for him or her, and talk to a couple of those people. Say, and 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 so be be selective and be and, and put as much work into into seeking that mentor, that employer as 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 you can, because that will come that will come back and and pay you dividends in in the future you're 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 trying to develop a pedigree in that particular aspect of 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 the job so that you'll be as marketable as as possible the other thing i i i was had a green chairman who was very very uh special to me in the early years and and he clearly said ted i don't care where it is if you hear of something that is being done that's better than what you think we're doing. You you get on your horse and get out there. Uh, we'll we'll find the money to make that happen. And and I learned very quickly that if a member came back to me and said, Ted, I just played in the member guests at X Y Z, and you should see what they're doing. I went over I went over and saw what they were doing to to verify whether whether it was just a you know just a, hey excuse me whether it was just hype to um, you know, to, to gear up for their special event, or whether it was something that we could really benefit and learn from, and that's where I, most of everything that I ever did, I really, I mean, I'm I'm not that innovative myself. I copied somebody and just took it to the next step, and um, I appreciated that very much. Whenever we went to a a conference or a meeting, and my wife was a, a big help to me in that particular aspect. We would sit at a table where we didn't know anybody. Um, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm I'm not an outgoing person. I'm shy, but my wife can make conversation with anybody and everybody. Probably the only one better at greeting people is that little dog that you heard, <laughs> than my than, than than my wife. So so she would break the ice, and I would get to to meet new and strange people um, from different areas. And it really it really helps you to grow when you hear what other people are doing elsewhere um you don't become so inbred as as you can become you know i think metropolitan new york area was at the top of its game but it was awful good to hear uh, what other people were doing too good good ted uh, last question i want to ask you one that didn't, that's not on the script is but what's been the best part of just having this career for you personally what's what's the best thing um 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 
We've, we've made friends all over the world. Uh, friends that uh, are really, I would call, you know, good friends. Um, they're not people that you'd call and talk to every single day and everything, but you know if and when uh, you need help or if and when you were stuck somewhere or if there was someone you would like some advice from, uh, there's always someone out there who's going to pick up the phone when you call. And, and that, that, that's been pretty special. Clearly, I know I dodged the questions about where I've traveled to and everything. The experiences of traveling to Morocco, the experiences of traveling to Taiwan, to Thailand, to, to uh, th those areas, um, and the stories that I can tell relative to those, those places were, were, are, are absolutely fascinating and, and, and wonderful. And, and in most cases, again, my family got to travel with me because that was important to me and that was part of the deal of, you want me, you get the family. And, and um, um, it was, um, it, the profession has been very good to me. Um, um, I, I don't know what else to say about that. I mean, it's been, been, a, been a, a wild and fun ride. <laughs> I think you said it great, Ted. Well, hey, I, I appreciate you taking the time, and it's always it's always great to catch up with you. And, and I got you to talk a little bit about those international spots too. So that's that's I'm happy for that. But uh, but Ted, Ted, thank you for all you've done for us at Golfdom and for the industry. And uh, you're obviously well deserving of this uh, moniker from Anuvia and, and Audubon. Uh, so and, and and great work on like the butterflies and building ramps for people. I mean, just golly, you don't. Is there anybody nicer than Ted Horton in the industry? I don't know. Good job, man. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure there are. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Everybody, this is Ted Horton, CGCS. You know him. He's famous. And I'm just happy I get to talk to guys like this. I'm Seth Jones, Golfton Magazine. Thanks for watching us here on Golfton TV.